Hey guys, what's up? Unrested back again, and I want to say thank you to the newest members of the Unrested channel. We've got Andre Sanchez, Sprinkly Donut, and Smile Kita 13. I'm shocked that I already have members who have joined the membership. Um, thank you for that. I didn't expect that would happen as soon as I started that on the channel. So, already got three members. If you'd like to join, it's only 190 a month. And uh, it gets you stuff like stickers, seals, emojis. There's going to be a private Discord. And there'll be one extra video release for members when I eventually figure out how you're able to unlist so that everybody can't see what you put up, even if they're not a member. Let's jump into today's topic. And that is pretty much after living in Japan for 15 years, how does America appear to you once you come back? How much reverse culture shock is there when you arrive back in America? We have a viewer, the Dynasty Warrior 13, who wrote 12 questions for me to answer about this, and they are insightful and well written questions that I think really pierce the veil as far as revealing how different America feels after being away for 15 years in Japanese society. Let's begin with number one. How hard did reverse culture shock hit? Um, pretty hard. Um, I think the, the strangest aspect was just how different politics felt in America when I came back, like how people are like super overly passionate about politics. When I left back in 2007, no one really cared too much about anything political, um, how much the entire culture is geared around the internet. Um, I'd say a lot of opinions in Japan aren't forged via the internet, whereas I feel like in America a lot of people forge their opinions on anything from what they've read on the internet rather than what they've seen IRL. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, there's also like a lot of slang that I missed out on for the last 15 years. So there was like a lot of slang words I had to pick up on again, but I don't know if that's, that's not really reverse culture shock. That's more really like a language shock, picking up all the pieces of the language that you missed while you were gone. Um, number two, how different is working in America's educational system um, different from being an educator in Japan? Uh, it's really different. It's really super different. Um, to be quite honest, I'd say the good part about the American education system is I think it's very open-minded to allowing teachers to be creative um, and expand students' minds beyond just the books that they're given to teach um, or the books that the kids are given to read. If you want to completely construct a lesson that is your own total creation from top to bottom, America's fine with that as long as you meet like the benchmark requirements for kids to pass things like star and fast testing, which allows them to get into the next grade and stuff like that. If you're able to teach that by making up an entirely uh, self-made lesson with your own resources that you created yourself they're okay with that whereas Japan wants you to use their books only their books and follow only the lessons in their books and those books will never change for you know decades at a time it's kind of the reason why some of their systems have worked so well as far as like they have mastered the way to teach math but because they're still teaching the same books from like 30 years ago on how to teach English, they have not mastered how to teach English. Like they've never updated that. They've never gotten back to uh, reformatting books. They keep coming out with new titles and new names for the same books that teach the same few lessons that don't help kids learn English. Um, so there are certain things where I think if they had let, you know, even their own Japanese teachers make their own lesson that is a little bit more creative, I mean, they, they could advance beyond the English that they still used to speak, you know, 50 years ago, which is not really much English at all. They also use like really outdated songs that they're like, you will use these songs to teach children words. And it's like Beatles songs and like Mariah Carey and um, just really outdated stuff that 
you know, kids these days, you know, th those bands are fine. Beatles are fine. Mariah Carey's fine. But it's just not really, you're not going to get kids excited. Like, I see them trying to get the kids to sing the songs, and the kids are just looking at them like, why, why would I want to sing a Beatles song? I'm, you know, you say goodbye, I say hello. I'm not interested in singing this song. No one's listening to this song anymore. Um, where Japan kind of beats America into the ground as far as education is concerned is its structure. Things are planned three to four months in advance. Um, lessons are planned way ahead of time. Um, if kids are not passionate about learning or they just want to mess around, uh, they're eventually just kicked out of school. You don't have to deal with rowdy kids who are going to interrupt class. They'll just be like, oh, well, you shouldn't be going to this school anymore. Bye. And they're gone. They're like, oh, you're not interested in education? Okay, please leave. And uh, I'd say probably the biggest and most noticeable aspect is that parents uh, believe teachers 100% in Japan. Um, they pretty much, if you would call up a parent and be like, look, your kid is just not able to stay focused and they are messing up and disrupting the class, the, t the parent would come in and apologize to you rather than you have to like begging the parent to help work with the student's behavior to make them uh, a better student in class or just like you know you're hoping that you don't get some sort of crazy helicopter parent who's going to come in and scream at you that their child is perfect and that you need to be a better teacher because they know their kid is perfect whereas in America I've had parents who they'll they'll scream at you that their kid's never been disruptive in any situation and that they're a perfect angel and, you know, luckily I'm at a school where our administration like really backs us up and is like, no, look, <laughs> your student has been a problem in every class. We have a paper trail to show you the problems. And if they can't get it together, they're probably going to have to leave the school. Um, whereas in Japan, the parents would back up the teachers more. They're not going to try and make excuses for their kid. And like I said, things are just planned so much better. Like they plan so far in advance for things like you have sports day. They're practicing for sports day that happens in October. They're already practicing back in summertime to get ready for that. Um, if they're going to have a Christmas school play, they'll start practicing that probably at the very beginning of fall semester. Um, whereas in America, it, it really seems like they're just like, they'll sometimes tell you that week that, Hey, can you get kids ready for this thing we're going to have at the end of the week? And you'll be like, um, I guess I can. Okay. I guess we'll start practicing for that with one week notice. Um, that kind of blows my mind after having worked in Japan for 15 years where everything is like just planned ages in advance. Uh, number three, after all this time, does America still feel like home to you? Does it still have that comfortable homey feeling for you? Or has that gone away over time in favor of Japan feeling that way? <sighs> That is a hard question because there is aspects that do make me feel comfortable and at home here. But now there is aspects of Japan that I miss so badly and wish I could go back to because they felt comfortable. Um, I'd say the things that make me most comfortable or make me feel at home is just the fact that I can do everything in my own language. You really, you really take that for granted until you're put in a situation where you can't read every ingredient on the back of a box of something you pick up in a grocery store, where you can't uh, figure out the name for a specific thing you're looking for in a store and that you can just ask any staff member to show you where it is. Um, you come back to America and feel very comfortable that you know you're not going to say something silly or rude or uh, awkward because the language is your language. It's natural. So those aspects feel comfy. But one thing I did think would change when I came back to America, I thought I'd be more excited to um, go out and feel comfortable shopping or in crowds or... Um, in places that are public places because I always felt a little bit awkward in Japan um, just because you know people would stare at me or people 
couldn't speak my language or if they asked me a question it would be in Japanese and then I'd kind of panic because I don't know exactly what they're saying sometimes or I would answer in the wrong way or in a rude way um, but I found even in America when I go out by myself I don't feel overly comfortable I don't feel like I'm like ah I'm here with all my homies like I I still feel kind of like awkward and don't really like interacting a lot with the public. I don't know if that's happened over time just because of age or I'm more reclusive. Uh, I think I will say after you become a family man, you're not as interested in interacting with the outside world as much because you have your whole social network with inside your family. So you're just kind of like, I will go to the store. I will get these things done. I am not interested in having a conversation with anyone. I just want to get this work done and get back to my house and relax with my family. So I think maybe that's part of just getting older and becoming a family man. Um, I was surprised that that's not something that made me feel more comfortable. The other thing I was kind of surprised that I felt like, oh, I didn't know I would miss this so much, was um, the familiarity of the stores and shops and people who work there next to my house in Japan. Um, I miss that. Um, I never I never even thought about this when I was living there in Japan, but you know, I had a 7-Eleven where I walked downstairs and the counter worker or she was also the manager of the store knew my kids from when they were like tiny babies up until you know now that they're like 11 and 13 and she'd even save certain items that she'd know they'd want to buy um, she'd save them behind the counter and be like oh hey we got this in and I saved one for you so that your kid can get it and like that's such a small sweet thing to do and I thought like oh that's so cool that like we've known her for so long and then when I got to America, I was like, I really miss that like close knit sort of small town feel in a big city that you get in Japan. You start to get this, you know, because you see the same people every day. You walk down the same paths. Everybody walks to work in the same way. Everybody takes the same subway together, even though you're in this big city. Whereas in America, we all like lock ourselves into cars, drive to work. And I don't think I remember seeing the same car every day I don't wave to people in their cars on my way to work that's that would be freaking weird um, <laughs> so I miss those small aspects of familiarity of the things around me like that I knew if I went into loft the the store next to my house the kind of mall next to my house um, all the same stores would be in there and then I knew what I could get from those stores and um, that was nice that I knew I could get like cheap sushi really easy or that these days um, the one type of beer my wife loves to drink I could get at these times at this store whereas like America I'm kind of like well I'm gonna drive out to this place I've never been to before at this giant store that goes on for miles and hope I can find the things that I want and maybe they're there but I will say uh, America is better at providing more variety as far as anything you're trying to buy is concerned. Um, and just stores in general have like a massive variety of things. Like in Japan, I always thought the thing that used to really like piss me off, I guess, is that you'd go to a grocery store and like they would only have groceries. You couldn't get things like uh, I don't know, if you needed cold medicine because your kid had a cough, you couldn't also get that there. If you had um, a vent that you needed to buy for your air condition system, you couldn't buy that. You'd have to go to another mechanical store to get that. Whereas in America, you can get all those things. You can get a bunch of cleaning supplies if you need to. You can get dog food and cat food. You don't have to go to a pet store to get that stuff. You get all this different stuff at a grocery store. There's just more variety and more convenience. Um, but I will say, you know, the convenies, the convenience stores in Japan have a massive amount more convenience than those in America. If I go to a gas station convenience store here in America, there's nothing but garbage to buy for food or drink. Whereas in Japan, I mean, you could get a really healthy sushi dinner or sashimi dinner um, at, a conveni at a convenience store, the equivalent to a gas station store. So I miss that. I miss having that kind of convenience next to my house. Um, those are the big differences. I hope I've explained that well enough. <laughs> uh, number four, I know you mentioned a lot about Japan's recent struggles and tension in Asia. So would you recommend people still consider moving to Japan if that's something they are considering or would you advise against it? 
I kind of covered this in my why you should not move to Japan right now video. Um, I would say that the tensions between like Asia and China and Asia, Asia and China, Japan and China and Japan and North Korea are not so high that you shouldn't consider moving to Japan. Um, I mean, number one, the US and Japan are buddy buddy when it comes to anything military. So if North Korea really does try something, if China really does try something, they're facing down America too. America does not like to see Japan messed with. They are very happy with their situation in Japan. They also have bases in South Korea too, and they don't want to see South Korea messed with, which is very close to Japan. Um, will tensions continue to rise? I, my personal belief, and look, I'm not coming at you with massive political military sources or economic sources. I'm just telling you what I saw as far as, you know, um, the overall theoreticals going on between the society of Japan talking about China and stuff like that. It seems like China is in such a slump that if they did try to go to war, um, it would affect their economy even more. And right now their, econ their economy is like plummeting. Like if you think Japan is doing bad as far as their GDP is concerned, China is doing far worse. Like they are in a great downward slope right now. I think you're going to see their GDP start to drop far below Japan's um, and Germany's and everybody else's. They're going to drop out of that second place position, I think, faster than you think, especially when everybody's fully moved all their factories over to Taiwan, which is happening quite quickly. Taiwan and India. Um, so I don't really think China's going to go all out war, but, but I could be wrong. Okay, I know there was people who said they thought Russia was never going to attack Ukraine and that happened. So I don't want to say 100%. I know for sure China's not going to attack Taiwan. It could still happen. If that happens, I would say definitely don't go to Japan. Um, but I, I kind of feel like China in general, they're way too worried about like their residential economy situation and their population problems too, which... Are mimicking the same type of population problems Japan is facing as far as there not being enough young people to pay for the old people as far as Social Security is concerned that's gonna happen in China like 10 times worse over the coming years um, as far as North Korea is concerned I don't know I mean they're almost like a cartoon character when it comes to how they act the only way I'd see them ever really doing anything to Japan is by like some sort of nuclear mistake that they make out in the ocean or with their silly missiles and stuff like that. And I mean, if that happens, that happens. That's kind of like a shogunai situation. Nothing can be done. They're going to keep screwing around with bombs and everything until they either screw themselves up or screw up a country close to them, which if you're okay with that, move to Japan. Who cares? Don't worry about the cartoon characters next to them. Um, but I think you're eventually going to see North Korea either, either screw themselves up with all the experimenting they're doing with missiles or screw up a country close to them, which is going to have such a backlash that it's going to put them back to the Stone Age when someone retaliates. Um, I really feel like they're messing with a ticking time bomb as far as North Korea is concerned. If that doesn't give you any kind of tension, I'd say go ahead and move. But I'd also say focus more on the economy aspects as far as dissuading you from moving. The economy in Japan, not so hot. The job situation, not so hot in Japan. Um, please really research that and consider that before you move there. It is not great pay as an English teacher right now. And unless you have a wealth of savings or you have some sort of better job lined up than just simply teaching English, I would say you're going to really be struggling if you move there simply to teach English. If you're going to try and move there with a family, just don't. Don't try to move there with a family unless your family is half Japanese or Japanese or you are Japanese American and you can already speak Japanese and get yourself into some other industry than teaching. All right, let's move on to number five. After 15 plus years living in Japan full time, are there any big life lessons that you think living there has taught you over time? That's a good question. Um, I'd say there's two. The two biggest things Japan has taught me is harmony at work. Harmony at work and working extremely hard are by far two of the big lessons. That actually makes it three because I'm thinking of another one too. But um, harmony at work and working really hard and showing 
that little extra, like going beyond. So, for example, if people created something for an event in a Japanese English school, they are like,、uh, you need to make some props for our upcoming Christmas play. They wouldn't just make like, they wouldn't be like, okay, this is good enough. They'd be, take hours to really craft it and make it look wonderful, like almost professional quality stuff. And we're talking for things like a little kindergartner's play where those crafts are probably just going to be thrown out after. That taught me to also show a lot of passion and to go above and beyond in my own work.、Um, if I'm asked to do something like volunteer for an event at my school, I don't just volunteer. I try to add a bunch of decorations to it. And you know, make sure I greet every parent、um, and tell them like, how great their kid is at the school. Parents love to hear stuff like that. I want to go the extra mile now because I saw Japanese people do that and I saw that really highlight not only their passion for their job, but just make them look better for their boss and stuff like that. I mean, that's what you want to do.、Um, you want to have longevity at your job, and to do that, you got to make yourself a worthy employee.、Um, I also saw harmony at work where even if you do something that isn't outright you know, malicious, you're not trying to make somebody angry, you could do something that could make a person's day more complicated or make them have to do a little extra work, and that they would apologize for that, for making an, a fellow staff member do something extra because either they couldn't be there or you know, something was a conflict, a conflict in schedule. And they would apologize. They'd be like, I'm so sorry. And the other person would be like, Yeah, don't worry about it. Like, no one would ever get angry or anything. But it was that extra step of saying that you were sorry, that you acknowledge you added a little extra work to their plate, and that you notice that, you empathize with that, and you thank them for doing that little extra that you couldn't do to be there. So, for example,、um, recently we had、um, an event at my school where my Crafts, my arts and crafts were used for an event just as decoration, and another teacher's were too. And all those arts and crafts and that other teacher's、um, stuff that she had made were all put away somewhere where I didn't know where they got、uh, cleaned up and put away.、Um, I wasn't in charge of cleaning those up, but when that teacher couldn't find her stuff, she was a little bit upset because she wanted her things back because she used them year after year, which is totally understandable. Um, my, mine personally, I don't care if my stuff gets thrown away.、Um, but when I found out she couldn't find where her stuff was because it had been stored with mine, I apologized to her that I didn't check up to see what happened to her stuff because I didn't care about my own stuff. That's not my fault that her stuff got taken away and put away or thrown away or wherever it ended up. But because I didn't check on my own stuff, her st- I had no idea where her stuff had gone. And the maintenance staff was the one who took care of that stuff. They, they cleaned everything up. But I also wanted to apologize to her to say, like, sorry, I didn't check out where your things went. And of course, she was totally nice. She's like, don't worry about it. It's like, not your fault. But I wanted to let her know, like, I empathize with the fact that she wanted these things back that she worked hard on. And someone didn't notice that and got rid of them.、Um, you know, again, that's not my fault. That's, that's not something I was in charge of. But I want to let her know that people do care that she put a lot of hard work into that. And I want that extra mile to let her know that. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here or say how, what a great person I am, but I feel like those small touches in your job、um, make the place, the harmony of the workplace, work better and put people at ease and make working together easier when you go that little extra mile to let people know, like, I care, I notice you. Um, I realize the effort you put in, and I don't want that to go unacknowledged and you to just feel like used and abused here. I want you to know that your work is worthy and worth it. And it's not just about longevity, it's about meritocracy, and I want your merit to be awarded and paraded.、Um, the other thing I just say is not getting angry, not showing anger. Japanese hide their anger a lot. Sometimes this can be unhealthy, of course, but. I saw people at jobs in Japan, gaijin, mostly, only, show their anger at a job, show their frustration, show their negativity towards a situation that was unfair. And, you know,、um, usually when I saw gaijin get angry or, you know, say, like, this is unfair, this is stupid, this is inefficient, why are we doing this? They, they had a good point. It was true. But Japan is not the place that you do that. You don't. 
get up in front of your meeting where the boss is talking and be like, why are we doing this? This is such a dumb idea. We could just do it this way. Guess what? It's always been done that way and you being negative about it or getting angry about it isn't going to change your tradition that's been around for years before you showed up in Japan and wanted to push your American way on it. Um, you're right. It might be a totally stupid thing. It might be done in a totally dumb way, but you're not going to change it by being negative and angry and showing your emotion. So I feel like I myself also watching this go down learned, okay, when this kind of thing comes up, not only should you agree with it and be like, yeah, sure, let's do it. But you should have a positive spin on it and be like, yeah, I think we can do that. And I think we could do this and this to add to it to make it even better. Um, your negativity isn't going to make something go smoother in Japan. And I think the same thing is true for America. It works really well to just be positive about whatever situation someone already has set up to get something going. And just adding more positivity to it by saying like, okay, I'll also help with this and this um, makes everything just move smoother and you get along better with everybody. Um, I feel like those are two really big skills that I picked up in Japan and brought back to America that have helped me a ton. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Um, number six, coming back to America, has your opinion of it all changed? If so, in what ways? I'm so curious how being away for this long has changed the way you view it and what your overall opinion on it is now that you're back. Um, I guess like I've said before, it's this whole culture war thing, this whole political agenda thing, this whole I'm on a team and I represent a team and it's either this red or blue team, this Democrat or Republican team. Why do we need to be on a team? Why do people think they're part of a team now in America? Why do they think that politicians care about them? Um, I never thought any politician cared about me in Japan and I don't think any politician cares about me in America. I'm not part of anybody's team. I'm not on either side. I love people equally. I care about people equally. I don't care what the religion, agenda, political belief, creed, code, anything is. Um, if they're a good person, they're a good person. That's what matters to me most. Um, and I don't understand why people want to get into these culture war arguments that separate us more and more. Um, is it the media pushing this? Yeah, maybe. Is it politicians pushing this? Yeah, maybe. Um, why are we being zombies and being led by it? I don't get it. Like, you know what you should care about? You know whose team you should be part of? Humanity. How about we just care about humans in general? Instead of saying like, well, you like this or you're like this way or you're part of this team. Or, but can we just like, can we just all get along? Like, this is so stupid. Why are you, why are you doing this, America? Like, as someone who came back here, 15 years later, we're back in 2007, no one was part of a team, no one was representing a culture war on either side of the political spectrum. This looks so dumb to me. Stop it. Is that, did I get too angry there? <laughs> Number seven, um, now that you're spending time in the US and can feel the differences between the US and Japan, what is one thing you wish Japan would learn from the US? And what is one thing you wish the US could learn from Japan? Okay. Um, and the, the question continues on a little bit longer. It says like, this can be anything like technology, a belief system, whatever. Um, I think I'm going to kind of reiterate some of the things I've already said in other questions, but I mean, the biggest thing America could learn from Japan is live and let live. Um, no one in Japan is so passionate about a political party in the diet, and the diet is their political system. If you don't know, look it up. It's a long explanation. No one is so passionate about any politician or political system within the diet or any party within the diet that they would let it bring anger into their life towards another person. There is no one in Japan like, what? You don't believe in this political system? Don't you think this is... like? For example, there is very conservative people in Japan who have very old-timey conservative beliefs, such as, I want a housewife who's in the kitchen making me you know, dinner every night and taking care of the kids, and I work as a salaryman and make all the money, I'm the breadwinner. And you know what their opinion on like more liberal things like you know LGBTQ T, T, T plus or all that stuff, you know, like all their opinion is, I, I don't care, fine, whatever. 
It doesn't intersect with my life, so why would I even care about it? They're super conservative. Liberal stuff goes on around them. Maybe they're a salary man who walks through Akihabara each day, um, you know, where LGBTQ plus stuff is totally okay and everybody's fine with it. Those salary men don't care. They're not going to stop and be like, I can't believe there's transgender people here in Harajuku. They don't care. They're just like live and let live. They're just like, why would that bother? I just go to a job and work. Like, why would I even care? It doesn't affect my life. Um, you know, and the same thing goes for the liberal people in Japan. LGBTQ plus people aren't like, salarymen need to have more representation of transgender in their workplace. Like, there's nobody campaigning for stuff like that. They're like, they're salarymen. They just want to go there and work their 12 hour job, come home and, you know, drink beer at night and chill. Why would I care about what they do? Like, they don't bother each other with this cultural bullshit. Like, there's, that's, I think, one thing uh, America could really learn from Japan. Live and let live. You know, shogunai, nothing can be done, all right? It, it is what it is, you know? Like, that's how Japan works. And they work in harmony in that way, where I think America used to be like this in the 1990s, where they were just kind of like, live and let live. Like, if you really, you know, got into a person's business and said, like, what do you think about this conservative situation of everybody owning guns to protect their family? Or what do you think about transgender people as teachers in the classroom? Like maybe you could get their opinion if you really dug down deep on them to get them to give their opinion on something. But mostly they didn't shout it out loud all over the internet. Um, you know, we didn't really have much of an internet back in the 1990s too, but people weren't so belligerent about it. In Japan, it's still that way. It's still like no one's shouting or screaming about this stuff. I'm sure you could find some very small niche that's outside of that realm, but for the most part, it's live and let live. Nobody cares. Now, that's the thing America could learn. What could Japan learn from America? Um, I think Japan's biggest problem is um, if, you know, in America, it's like if it works, don't try to fix it any bit more. But if it's broken, what are you doing? Try to fix it, make it better, okay? And I feel like with Japan, there's a big problem where if it's broken, just let it be broken. Who cares? This is how we've done it for so long. Um, so for example, small things like Japan always has problems with electricity being too expensive, being too high, constantly um, being asked to turn off air conditions during the summer because it puts too much pressure on the electrical system for TEPCO who never seems to update or fix anything. That's the electric company that mostly runs most electric in Japan. Um, yet they refuse to do stuff like update technology such as having, oh, I don't know, insulation inside of apartments and houses um, or doing things like running uh, central AC to keep things cool. Instead, they keep using these ancient space coolers that just drain electricity for hours on end. I mean, they must absolutely destroy people's electric bills the way these things run during the summer. And Japan never wants to change that. They're just like, well, this is how we've always done it. Like, why would we change this now? Why would we start doing things like adding insulation to buildings so that they stay cooler or warmer depending on the season? Um, well, the reason you would do that is to like be more efficient with your electricity and you know, leave less of a carbon footprint on earth, um, you know, to stop these super high electric bills, to stop people from living in poverty when they retire because their electric bill is way too high. Um, I think the other thing is America is far more sympathetic when it comes to childcare. Um, you'll never hear about a kindergarten shortage or childcare shortage in America, they'll be like, oh, you need more schools, you need more kindergartens for kids, you need more childcare for kids. Okay, yeah, of course, like we want you to have kids. Whereas Japan just kind of caters only to old people. They're having a population problem where the population's about to cut in half by 2050. Uh, we've talked about this so many times, it's a beaten subject. I don't want to go over it too much, but Japan refuses to do anything about that. They don't make cheaper, you know, childcare. They don't make more accessible childcare. They don't build more kindergartens. Instead, they do stuff like tear playgrounds out of neighborhoods because it's too loud for the old people who go to bed at 4 p.m. And then they wonder why no one wants to have kids. It's like, really? Like, you don't, you don't see the problem with this? Like, you know, like, I will say... America in general does a better job of being sympathetic towards people with kids. 
uh, in taking care of people with kids. That's why you're not seeing a massive population drop in America. I think it is going down a little bit, but it's not anywhere near what is happening in Japan. Our population is not about to be cut in half by 2050. Okay, number eight. How do most people in Japan feel about the whole China situation? Do most people have a negative perception of China? Are they worried about the possible conflict over Taiwan or island chains? Um, before I left, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll be honest, man. People in Japan, man, like I, people in Asia in general, if you want to find the most racist people <laughs> in the world, and I know like people are probably surprised to hear this all the time, but Asians from all over the world are super racist towards each other. Um, if you want to ask their opinion on South Korean people or Chinese people, they all don't like each other <laughs> and they don't trust China at all. Um, my own perception of China is not great and I feel like probably I've been influenced by some Japanese um, influences. I watch a lot of stuff about China and Japan as far as their economy is concerned. I don't dislike Chinese people. I think Chinese people are great. I don't like the CCP. I think the CCP is evil. Um, you know, I think Xi Jinping is evil. I think a lot of the politicians in China are evil. But guess what? I think a lot of the politicians in America and Japan are also evil. In fact, this is going to blow your mind. I think politicians internationally are evil. I don't trust politicians. Um, now, as far as Japan and China, I don't know. They keep firing back and forth on each other. Um, I think they both create a lot of tension just by constantly <sighs> accusing the other of doing stuff where I don't know what's true anymore. And honestly, that's kind of that's kind of a situation where like you almost want to stay out of it because I'm not Chinese and I'm not Japanese. So is it my place to really say anything at all? Number nine. Is the current plan to stay in the U.S. until your son finishes school and then make a decision about going back to Japan or not? I guess my question is this move back to the U.S. more of a let's take this year by year and see how it goes or is this a decision we've decided to make and we're committed to it type of thing? Um, that is a very good question. Um, so far, we are kind of taking it bit by bit as we go. We kind of have a plan. Um, so right now, I'm living my life between Japan and America. Um, that's why whenever I see people be like, oh, you're, so you're never going to consider being Japan, going back to Japan or being Japanese or going to Japan ever again, or you're never going to have Japanese vlog style anymore. It's, no, I'm going, like I'm literally leaving in about three more months to go back. Um, let's see, March, April, May. Yeah, a, about three more months to go back. And I'll be back there for two months. So I'll be living part of my life there for the summertime. Um, I'll probably be doing this every summer. So I'll be in Japan in the summer. And then during the school year in America, I'll be in America. Um, I plan to do this as long as I can, um, at least until I have my house paid off here in America. And then once I have my house paid off here in America, that's a good question how things change then. I may live half my life in Japan, like half of the whole year in Japan, and half of my whole life in America. It really depends on what the future of my job holds here in America, um, the future of my wife's job. Her big thing is she eventually does want to um, start up a small business in America doing kintsugi, which if you don't know what kintsugi is, it's repairing plates and cups that are like very nice with gold in between. Um, I would just suggest looking it up online. My description is not quite enough. Um, it's part of like the Wabe Sabe aesthetic within art of Japan. Um, just look up Kintsugi online. K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I. All right, and you'll, you'll understand it better than I can describe it. Totally a Japanese art, by the way. She wants to eventually start a business here doing that, which I 100% support. Um, I want to continue teaching art. I'm loving it. I'm having a great time. Um, and I also want to be able to go back and forth between Japan uh, because I also still have a house there and everything too. Um, people, people seem to forget that. I don't, I don't know if people think like I sold my house in Japan or if they think like I've totally moved everything. I have half my stuff in Japan. I have half my stuff over here in America. Um, but 
number one, the the one thing we do need to wait for is we need to wait for my eldest son to go to college before we make a choice on a permanent residence. Um, after he goes to college, we may choose to sell one or the other, um, or we may keep both if we like going back and forth all the time. Um, we have to wait for my youngest son too to eventually get to a point where he's in college as well, I think, if we're going to be making the trips back and forth pretty regularly. Um, but definitely when my oldest son goes to college, my wife has thought about moving here and beginning her kintsugi business then. Um, as far as my own stuff is concerned, I don't know if one day YouTube took off, maybe I would be more uh, Japan-based because then I could go between the two because you don't have to be in an office or a job. But I don't ever see that happening and I don't ever see Japan, I mean, I don't ever see YouTube becoming a full-time job. That's not something I think is really very possible. Um, that's the only way though that I would ever imagine living full-time in Japan again. Um, because I'd have to have something that was remote work. Yeah, I definitely would. Ha I would definitely have to have something that was remote work to be able to live full time in Japan again, um, unless Japan's GDP suddenly shoots up to number one overnight, and that's not happening. That never happens to any country. Um, so that's the plan right now. Wait for the eldest son to finish high school and go to college, then choose to live most of our time in America or Japan. Um, then wait for the second son to go off to college and then probably permanently choose whether we live in America or Japan. Whew, that was a long question. Um, number 10. We're getting close to the end. It's 12 questions, okay? Are there any J vloggers out there that you still keep in touch with from time to time? I did message, I got a message from Victor. Give me a break, man. Give me a flake, man. When I got here, he wanted to check if I really actually had moved to America. Um, is there anybody else I still talk to? Um, I talk to some people who don't do YouTube anymore. I have a friend named Adam who sometimes I talk to on Facebook who used to do YouTube a long time ago. Um, I have another friend who is still in Japan, Joey, who does a tarot card reading channel. He's not really a J vlogger though. He's more about tarot cards. Um, you should check out his channel. I got my friend Dan. Dan came to Japan a bunch of times. He's got his channel, Cursed Urban. Um, you should check it out. I still talk to him. We're still actually really good friends. We're still talking all the time. Um, but they're not, I guess, I don't know. They're not J-vloggers, though. Actual, like, Hiko Simon. I see Hiko Simon's posts all the time on Facebook. Um, I never comment them on them, but I should. I should say, hey, what's up sometime. I see Busan Kevin's posts on Facebook. We're still friends. I still see him update. I can never figure out where Busan Kevin lives anymore, like what country. It seems like he changes what country he's in like every five minutes. I can't figure it out anymore. That guy is busy. Um, let's see. Rattery, I did a, a show on his channel like a, a while back called Why Come Japan. Um, any of the really, really, really old school? No. That's about it. Um, oh, I would love to get in contact with them again and just talk about the nostalgia of when J vlogging was so close and we had that tight knit community. I miss that. That was so fun. Um, I'm sad to see those days have disappeared over time, but you know, it happens. YouTube evolves. We're, we're kind of all the has-beens now, right? Aren't we? Like, I mean, there's bigger channels out there that make ours look like, you know, just sort of home kits, you know? Um, but I, I don't know. I enjoy this aesthetic. I enjoy this sort of comfy talk with my viewers type situation. Um, I may eventually, I think when I get to Japan in the summertime, I am going to try and work on a more documentary style vlog, like some of the documentaries I did in the past, like the Hikikomori one and Dark Side of Japan stuff. I'm going to work on one of those while I'm in Japan um, and do something that's like highly edited and well put together. Uh, but for now, I just really enjoy this like close-knit community with my viewers who I still talk to. I try to comment on everybody's stuff in the comments below, and that gives me kind of the feel of the old J-Vlogger style, and that's what I love. That's what I'm passionate about. Um, and I think that's why a lot of those other J-Vloggers still do what they do, because I think they're all still going. Um, number 11, how do you feel about Chris abroad? Um, abroad in Japan. As the J-Vlog community started to slow down some, I feel like he became the next big thing in Japan. 
uh, I actually hung out with Chris one time and he was a very nice guy. He was awesome. Um, Chris is intelligent in a way that benefits his YouTube career. He had a whole plan ready in his mind when we hung out and he told me about it. I remember we were eating at, um, what was the name of this pizza place? There's like some pizza place, it was a pizza buffet place where you get unlimited pizza for two hours. You can eat as much pizza as you want in Japan. It's the most garbage pizza you've ever had, but there's a lot of it, so we liked it. Um, and he, I sat next to him and he laid out this whole plan that he had. And this was way before he was at like a million subscribers or anything like that. I think he was only at like getting close to 100,000. And I thought like, this dude understands YouTube on another level that I will never understand. Like he understood analytics and everything like that, like on another level. And I was just like, this guy's gonna make it. I know this guy's gonna blow up. And he did. <clears throat> and um, I think that that's, that's good. It's good for Japan in the way that like, he comes across as very balanced where he'll talk about bad things, he'll talk about good things, and he won't um, be too flowery with his descriptions of things. He'll just be very um, short and curt about things that suck in Japan and things that are great and wonderful about Japan. Um, I like his take on Japanese TV. Japanese TV is mostly garbage. Um, being on Japanese TV is not really very fun either. Um, they do make you do silly, weird things when they interview you where they'll be like, okay, now shoot this again and put it in your mouth and say, oh, Ishi, it's so delicious. Um, and now, okay, go back in to your house again, open up the door again and come out with the takoyaki again and say how delicious it is and let's shoot this three more times. Um, it's totally fake. Um, you know, and then like every show is a cooking show. Um, it's not these wild game shows that people think Japan has all the time. Yeah, like so I like his take on stuff like that. Um, and I think it was just the natural evolution of what you needed to become to be able to be big in Japan. Do I wish I could have his sort of success? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wish I could have a channel like that, but I would definitely need a crew. I would definitely need like more help as far as editing is concerned. Um, I need his level of skills and I just don't have those. Um, and I, I don't feel there's anything wrong in admitting that. I don't have the level of charisma, jokes, dry humor, and editing and filming ability that he has. He's a talented guy and that's why he made it far. His talent took him to where he's at. And I wish him all the best. I don't, I know there's some people out there who are just like, he's a loser, I don't like it. He's a, he stole away the J vlog, you know, that's just people being envious, you know. Um, nice guy, genuine person, had a great plan, did it, followed it, and he's at the top of his game now. And I wish him all the best for that. Number 12, what's one place in Japan that you think maybe lots of foreigners don't know about that you really like, that you'd recommend to people to visit? I ask because I may be taking another trip there. You need to go to Mount Koya. Um, it's an esoteric Buddhist graveyard um, where people have to pay millions and millions of dollars to be buried there. And it has this like certain very specific sect of Buddhism that is, they just call it esoteric Buddhism, which just means like super unique Buddhism, I guess it would, that's what it would mean. But it was brought over from a region of China where they mastered it, learned it, brought it over it was taught there it's got things like um, part of the temple has carved statues of Baku the dream eater which I always love that you can have a religion a worship and a deity that it surrounds eating the dreams that are nightmares and leaving the good dreams for you to dream but if you call on him too much he might actually start to eat your good dreams so be temperate with how much you call on Baku the dream eater he's actually carved into like the temple arches and the Tory gates and stuff like that and i love i love that aspect that it gets into this like almost fantastical world of shinto myth m mythology it's just incredible then you get to see the graveyards and the the graves at mount koya are like almost like a riotous laughter maker it's a, they're almost a comedy 
there's people who made coffee in the past. They were CEOs of a coffee company and their grave is a giant coffee cup. There's people who worked as an engineer and they had their grave made into a giant stone rocket. Like goofy stuff like that where it's like, this is so sad that this great person died, but also hilarious that they left their grave be a giant coffee cup. That is amazing. I love it 100%. And this graveyard goes on and on and on and on. Like you can walk through it for hours if you wanted to. It's so huge. And the gravestones are just incredible. There's beautiful Buddhist statues out there. There's a thousand year old garden that's being worked on all the time. There's beautiful Tory gates with incredible carved statues within. It's just so much. And I don't think a lot of people go there. It is a bit of a trip to get there. I remember taking like two different trains and have to taking this weird like slant style train that goes like slanted up a hill that it's really weird. It's almost built like like a like a Minecraft sort of blocky stair shaped train. It's very weird. And uh, it gets to the top and then you have to, once you get to the top, you have to take this bus and this bus goes on these roads that looks like you're gonna tip off the edge at any second. You get through this village that looks like it was from Edo era Japan. And then you finally get to the graveyard and it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Mount Koya, I highly suggest you check it out. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I don't know if I would like to make many, many trips to it. I've been there two times, but it is such a hassle to get up there, but very worth it once you do. Um, and I've had friends who've stayed at, um, you could stay at like Buddhist um, ryokans, Japanese style hotels there, but they're run by actual monks. And they are such polite and friendly and welcoming uh, caretakers of these hotels that I remember a friend leaving a jacket there accidentally and being like, well, that's lost forever. I'll never get that back. And they boxed up and like packaged his jacket up and then hand mailed it all the way back to him in like Tokyo. It took like two weeks to get there. And it was just like, hey, sorry, you forgot this in your room. We paid for the mailing and the packaging. We hope you get this okay. Please let us know if the jacket gets back to you. And it's just like, they, they've spent all this money like a ton of money to send the jacket back to him that probably cost almost as much as the room did because these rooms do not cost a lot. They're like a donation to stay there. And that's just crazy to me. Like what a wild little town there. Um, I hope I've covered everything. That was a lot. Um, again, I want to give a shout out to my three members, Andre Sanchez, Sprinkly Donut, and Smile Kita 13 If you also want to become a member, there's two different positions you can get in. 190 for the Gakse student level and uh, level two is I think five dollars a month and you're called the Kohai which means like the apprentice. You have a senpai but you also have a Kohai. No one ever talks about the Kohai. You know they always say notice me senpai but who's that person saying notice me? It's the Kohai. Um, so you have Gakusei student level membership, Kohai apprentice level membership and maybe one day I'm gonna add senpai level. Um, but I don't even, I need to think of benefits before I do that. I'm not going to just say, oh, okay, yeah, pay this much and uh, get the same thing as everybody else. Uh, if you join those, thank you so much, dude. You make this channel so much easier to run uh, when there's a little extra there to motivate me and give me the time to be able to make these. I'd like to make them more than just one time a week. Um, and you becoming a member allows me to get closer to being able to do that where... Maybe I don't have to work 15 and a half hour days sometimes to make the extra cash to be able to pay off my house one day. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you to everybody who watches this. Thank you to all my new subscribers. Um, I used to lose subscribers every time I made a video because anybody who wasn't watching anymore, um, after a certain amount of time, YouTube, like if, if they're not using the account anymore, YouTube deletes it. So I just lose a big chunk of subscribers every single time because They'll check, they'll be like, who actually still uses YouTube that's connected to this channel? Oh, they don't, these 200 people don't do that anymore? Let's get rid of those accounts. And I would lose a bunch of subscribers. Um, but now I'm noticing, even though I still lose some of those every time, enough new people subscribe that my subscriptions amount has kind of steadied out. And I thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Just being subscribed, just hitting like is like a payment in itself. And if I've earned your subscription, I'm very thankful for that. Um, stick with me more here on uh, Unrested. I'll probably be back next week and uh, keep your questions coming. I love questions like this. It gives me that very nostalgic JFAC Japan's frequently asked questions feel. And before I hit a solid hour on this video, I'm going to end it here and tell you 
Have a great rest of the day.